when you are actually uh, trying to assess the hip joint is that uh, what is the pathology and what is the range of the pathology that you can manage ar ar arthroscopically, how to actually assess it and how to reach to a positive conclusion in order to uh, perform your procedure and actually how much it is helpful in, uh, uh, in the relieving the pain of the patient and how to what can be done into it. Uh, from an indication point of view, I have actually divided my um, my indications into uh, three components. First is the articular sources of pain or the problems. Then, then the second component is an extra articular component, uh, which includes the periarticular part. And the third is a completely separate area, which is uh, a referred sort sort of a pain, which actually um, gives mimicking sort of uh, um, a pain inside your hip joint. So, talking about the intraarticular sources. Uh, the top of the, range, the line are the femoral acetabular impingement and uh, combined with liberal tears, there can be chondral damage, ligamentum tears there could be there, loose bodies, hip dysplasias and instability of the hip. Now, uh, these are some uh, indications which are written in the literature from the western part of the world, from our part of the world. We still live in the area of in, which is endemic in uh, tuberculosis. And we see a lot of uh, the hip collections, secondary hip collections, secondary to um, the tuberculosis, tuberculosis of the hip. In order to make a diagnosis, you can actually perform that. And plus, we see a lot of uh, septic arthritis of the hip regions as well. So that can be an intraarticular uh, indication. Coming to the periarticular sources, greater trochanter bursitis, napping hem syndrome, flexor strain, to tendinopathy, hamstring strain, piriformis syndrome and the gluteus medius and uh, minimus uh, uh, tendinopathy and tears which are prevalent. Uh, these uh, pathologies are prevalent in our part of the world because uh, of uh, some trochanteric rub which can be present and uh, which is uh, usually seen in, patients, in people who are actually coming from <laughs> rural areas uh, which they are actually prone to have some cultural sort of, uh, 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 of uh, practices which leads to this sort of problem. And the last one is that completely referred pain which is a completely mimicking pain. The pathology lies outside your hip joint, but your pain is actually coming from the lumbar spine. Uh, this can be abdomen. It can be due to uh, the uh, nerve impingements uh, from the spinal part of the region. So how to actually evaluate and how to actually reach to the conclusion in order to um, reach into a prob probable sort of uh, uh, treatment option for a patient. The first thing is the clear cut history. You need to uh, take a clear cut history your physical examination should be really sound and the physical examination point should be that much accurate that you where you actually uh, want to hit the pathology that actually your your clinical markers should be in your hand comes your uh, standard radiographs usually if you're looking at the the uh, the, uh, the fais uh, plane x-rays are uh, at times uh, enough to actually uh, give you a clue on some diagnosis and then comes your uh, the rule of MR arthrography or MR arthrograms which are actually tell you uh, that what is the status of the soft tissue structures which are present around the, the your, your, your periarticular hip joint. Now uh, I'll be talking about femoral acetabular impingement and uh, which is uh, the uh, an, an important region of, uh, of source of pain uh, seen mostly most commonly in young uh, young adults and uh, they've got some genetic predisposition to it and uh, studies have shown that 87% uh, of the patient with liberal tear have got an, uh, structural abnormalities so whenever you see an MRI showing uh, the uh, uh, liberal tear you need to actually go and uh, take out the, the, the causes of the pathology which can be a, a pincer or a cam lesion I'll talk about it uh, in, in the later slides and uh, this concept is actually uh, uh, the, the uh, but potentiating this concept actually leads to the um, formation of an osteoarthritis which actually uh, leads to into later stages and which uh, uh, can uh, lead to or not taken care of properly. So the pincer and the cam lesion, the cam lesion is basically a lesion which is an overgrowth seen in the part, part of the, uh, of the uh, femoral head and the, the, the pincer lesion is basically the overgrowth of the um, uh, the acetabulum part, which actually shows uh, the acetabulum uh, labrum, is basically a part which is part which is surrounded by uh, a deep shallowing. Unless uh, it is very different from the part from the shoulder joint, it has got a deep narrowing groove sort of thing. It is surrounded by your 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 labrum, which is all around, and the transverse uh, ligament is there on the posterior side, on the inferior side, and the, the, the vessels actually enter from the inferior part of the region. Uh, now, how does this uh, pincer mechanism
too much disturbance on the connection problem. It's okay, it's okay. Just wait till come. I think he's having problems with his connections. Yeah, just wait, be patient, he'll come back. Can we make sure we mute ourselves so we don't get uh, the interruption from other people, like I said? But Sufjan will come back, no worries. It's okay. Yeah, good. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we see you. Uh, yes, I'm extremely sorry for that. Uh, I don't know what is wrong. Can you see my presentation? We can only see your face now. There you go. Your presentation is okay. I'm really sorry for the interruption. It's okay. Um, Okay, so coming back, you see that the, going back to my previous slide, you see that there's some sort of a subluxating event in the proximal part of the of the uh, femur head of the femur, which leads which it becomes a pain generator and it predisposes to early formation of early osteoarthritis. Now, uh, coming to the concept of camp, you see that there is a there's the overgrowth on the on, on the femoral head. If your overgrowth is actually traveling inside. This actually hit the upper part of the of uh, the acetabulum, and it actually in turn leads to a little bit subluxating events and repeated um, uh, hitting of uh, the femoral uh, femoral head will actually cause the formation of uh, osteoarthritis. Now, uh, in order to uh, uh, it, it, uh, all these phenomena in understanding, it seems too easy to actually see that it, it, it seems like that if you go on and it, about the simple pathology, it will actually relieve it. It's not that much easy. Uh, people who are doing hip arthroscopies are very, very much con are concerned about their diagnosis and they use different modalities in order to uh, their diagnosis. So coming to the basic part of history and physical examination, it has private sort of an importance. Now in history, what should be uh, the, the, the prime aim? It should be a traumatic or any serious onset. There is any talking activity, subluxating events, whether you're looking at pathologies of DDH, of a Pulsis, or Skeffy, uh, which is common in, uh, in, uh, in pediatric population, or you're looking at patients. Now, uh, in coming to the history part, you need to know that whether the pain is coming from the lateral side or the posterior side, it's a growing pain, it's, it's actually associated with numbness. Which, uh, to in order to prove that what it see, uh, in order to uh, there is a the brief algorithm in order to uh, to uh, to make a sense that what type of pain actually you're actually uh, aiming for in coming to the history. If you see there is a lateral type pain, most commonly it is uh, the uh, the lateral component problems of bursitis, ITP snapping, piriformis are there. But if you see that it's a central component or anterior uh, thigh pain or a growing pain. Then the pathologies that you'll be suspecting are it will be impingement, labral, chondral lesion, loose bodies. And if it is coming from the peripheral compartment, then the, 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 most likely it can be coming from uh, the impingement, the aliosols or the loose bodies uh, formation could be there. Uh, and uh, the, all these phenomena, they actually leads to um, uh, your, your pain and which is twisting, running, long sitting, walking uphill. They, they are predominantly uh, they are your indicator markers. Uh, physical examination, you need to uh, have performed a few tests which are really important, anterior impingement tests in which you passively sack 20 degree followed by adduction and internal rotation. It gives you a very uh, precise idea. In order to look for the IT band syndrome, you can do perform your overs test in, in, the, in the lateral position in order to see that whether the propensity bursa is the source of pain. And you need to perform your favor test in order to differentiate pain coming from the sacroiliac joint and from the posterior side. And uh, at times, I, uh, the people who are routinely performing uh, hip arthroscopy, they will agree that they are a combined patient. There you see a lot of patients who have got combined sort of pain. It's uh, <coughs> this sort of pain, and it's very difficult for you to make a diagnosis. 
Now, in order for you to perform, what are the steps which will lead you to uh, actually not jumping up to uh, the, um, uh, the the concept of going into hip arthroscopy? Whether if you go into these sort of pathologies of impingement, arthritis, instability, or tight IT band, the first thing that you can do that you should do is to perform an injection test. You, you should perform. Uh, you should uh, put an injection inside the, the localized pathology, and there should it should always be. Uh, preceded by a trial of physiotherapy in order for you to reach up to that diagnosis. Sometimes the the, uh, the injection test can be applied with an ultrasound guided, and I have um, uh, I've seen people putting injections using C arm uh, imaging in actually directly entering into the central compartment of the hip after uh, dislocation. That Mr. Shah will be actually telling you how to distribute the hip in terms of when you are actually performing uh, the uh, hip arthroscopy. Now coming to a few. Other uh, sort of uh, problems that we are most commonly see that what happens is actually in osteoarthritis. Can you cure uh, the hip problem? All your hip problems are osteoarthritis. I'm not sure whether that can be the phenomena because they cannot be cured with arthroscopy. And uh, uh, we can, you can actually get rid of the pathology in the initial stages in order for you to, to, to them to facilitate in order to, to prevent this sort of recurrent subluxating events. Now, what about dysplasia of the hip? Um, yesterday, we actually had our city meeting in which a very interesting case was presented, in which the Foxa Magna was there, and it was a, he was an adult patient. But uh, the thing was that they were actually uh, trying to find out that whether that Foxa Magna can be cured uh, uh, isolatedly with the help of an arthroscopy. The answer is the uh, even at that time the consensus was no. And in terms of dysplasia, you need to understand that uh, the, the if you leave the head uncovered and you shape the upper part of the of the the femoral head, it will not lead to uh, it, it will not uh, relieve your problems. And you need to have measure your major acetabular inclination angles very very correctly whenever you are looking for a dysplasia. That a head should not be left uncovered even after uh, the shaping of your your camera. <laughs> There are some of the pictures uh, that uh, the after the pincer correction of uh, the the cam lesions. I'm sure this will all will be uh, discussed in detail by Mr. Sharp. And uh, 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 if you're expert in uh, and uh, in terms of your localization of your pathology, uh, you can actually bring very good results with some uh, with <coughs> sort of part or with some very difficult uh, bit of patients in which you can actually get rid of uh, a pathology in more. Uh, Sort of uh, uh, areas. So, uh, in order to conclude, um, uh, the hip, the concept of hip arthroscopy can uh, can only be addressed, and you need to understand the, the indication, the proper indication of actually uh, looking into that. The FAIs and the labral tears, they not all of them needs to be fixed. You need to understand the pathology, the extent, the uh, after an, an injection test, and then you need to your patients very very carefully in order for them to actually get better with your treatment. And the anatomy of the humeral head should be known in a very, uh, especially the blood supply, because if you uh, take out the lateral retinacular vessels in during your arthroscopy, in getting very aggressive in your cam lesion, you will see an uh, osteonecrosis of the uh, of the upper part of the femur that uh, that is basically seen. And uh, you should always take into account the advanced uh, the history, physical examination, use diagnostic injections as much as possible in order for you. To, uh, to uh, be very precise and uh, the osteoarthritis and dysplasia of the hip, these are two conditions which should actually mimic you and they push you to go into this procedure. You need to be careful in much extent that you're looking and the, 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 head, the area of the coverage of the head that should be uh, taken into account. So this will conclude my uh, first part of my talk, which is the indication of uh, the hip arthroscopy. Um, if there are any questions regarding um, this hip arthroscopy, um, uh, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to, uh, to ask. Over to you, Mr. Shah. So comments. I, I, I started doing arthroscopy in 2009, hip arthroscopies, okay? And I had uh, a, a, a very good tra training and actually um, I was very pleased with it. But as, as, as I grow older, I become wiser. That's what they say, isn't it? So uh, impingement is not my main diagnosis of doing arthroscopy now. So like, like Sufyan said, you cannot change anatomy. You can make it slightly better, but you cannot stop arthritis and you cannot make it, uh, you know, go away. So I do a lot more of, of other things besides uh, uh, impingements now, because if you're arthritic, you can only buy time. And, and, you know, I mean, believe you me, when you do arthroscopy for impingement, it's a struggle. It really is a struggle. 
to get into the compartment to do what you want to do and then get the results out of it. So I'm just going to give you a cheat code. If you see a person with hip pain, you do MRI scans for them, okay? Once you've done the MRI scan for them, uh, it will tell you other things, you know, like the pyriformis, the, the problem, or you have labral tears or something like that, okay? So what I would do is clinically, if they have groin pain, I would do what is called the lateral test. I will externally rotate the patient. And if he's got more external rotation than the other side, that tells me that the labrum has gone, okay? So that's the cheat code. You need to remember if, if they can do external rotation more on the side, which is painful to the other side, and you've excluded all back pain problems, then that's, that's because the, the labrum's torn. You can do the impingement test for the, for the cam and pincer lesions, but my practice these days is a lot more on, on, on labral repairs, taking loose bodies out, you know, do the pyriformis release. I also do the gluteal medial repair. So that's the easiest thing you can do with an arthroscope without giving big, huge scars. You know, when you put the patient on the lateral side, uh, the top of the crust is so easily, uh, trochanter is easily available that you can reattach these. I have special kit to do them, but that, that's the easiest part of it. The cam and pincer, I've given up quite a lot now. I don't do many cam and pincer. The reason is the, the results were not very good. My results with patients who have got uh, trochanteric bursitis is very good. Patients that I have gluteal medial tears, that's very good. Patients that I take loose body out is very good. I don't do it, but there's a guy in Manchester and he does the, the um, ligament and teres repair like an ACL. He says that athletes, high profile athletes, when they run and suddenly stop and twist on their hips, they tear the ligament and teres. And I had one patient I'd seen, and I sent it to him and he repaired it. And amazingly, he was, he was fine. So, so we all started doing hip arthroscopy is doing impingements, okay? However, impingement is not in my practice anymore, purely because I couldn't make them better. So I then send them to, to Mr. Sadiq, who does the early young adult hips, you know, and he sorts them out. But I put my hand up. Uh, I, I don't get results with impingement. You know, if, if, if the pathology is already arthritic, there's not much you can do. However, occasionally you have bumps from like a old Sufi or something like that, and they do okay. But full-grown arthritis or arthritis, which has got both cam and pincer present, which means there is a bump and the cuff of the labor has gone off, I can't make them any better. So comments, whatever you want to. That was my small take on it. Comments, yeah? Yeah, I have one curious, sir. How is it like, uh, uh, how is it? Can you? Yeah, I can't hear you, go on. Okay, is it fine now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, but it's, it's coming with break. But go on, ask your question. Yeah, so my curious is that how is it like you, someone, a master in shoulder, upper limb ending, yeah. up, having more, better, want to have a more focus in the hip joint at the lower limb. So, so remember when Pakistan had the earthquake in, in Balakot, I was based there. We, me and Mr. Sadiq went there to Balakot, right? And we were spending a lot of time doing trauma. So there was this white uh, English guy in a short, in freezing weather, and Ramzan's all we were fasting, but he was doing morning jogging. He was Richard Willer. So he was a, a pioneer in hip arthroscopy, and he was based there because the Marines sent him there, the British Marines. And I met him, and we had a cup of tea together with a crispy naan. That's what we were doing in breakfast, Oseri. So he told me that, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a shoulder surgeon. He said, impingement, hip surgeon needs impingement. Uh, labral tear, you can already do a labral tear. So he convinced me that you should do hip arthroscopy. And the poor man came to uh, uh, hospital uh, nearly every Monday, and he used to scrub with me to teach me how to do hip arthroscopy. So unfortunately, if you put so much effort in me, there was right, it didn't look right for me to give it up, and isn't it? So I've been doing them. I don't do many. I do about 25 or 30 a year purely because the impingement has gone out of my practice now. I don't do impingements anymore. It, it doesn't work for me. My presentation, I can. Like in shoulder, if you see, you have a vast major pathology, <laughs> liberal, <laughs> cuff, and so goes on. And same with the knee joint, if you see. Uh, can you hear? Okay. In your knee joint, if you see if all the ligaments, again, the meniscus, and a lot of pathology. But as per my, uh, my learning aspect, I want to, learn, uh, to know, hip itself doesn't... Uh, allow us to have more pathology or if pathology is at that level, it's very hard to deal with arthroscopy. Okay, so, so 
So my last slide on my talk will tell you that there's 127 indications for hip arthroscopy. Okay, okay. okay so you need to know what you're looking for before you can find it. Okay, so, so I've got a very short talk. I don't want to bore you guys with it, but uh, it, is, it is not as difficult as you guys think it is. It, it is I, I don't have special kit. I use the same stuff that I use for my shoulders and knees. So I don't have got a special you know, setup like most people will, they will do a lot of expensive things. I don't have that because I was a shoulder surgeon. If I said I'm going to do hip arthroscopy, my managers would have killed me, like I said. So they didn't allow me to, to buy anything. So all I have is what I have from the sets. I did make my own um, instruments, a couple of them. So I will share them with you. But most of the stuff I have is what was already available for me to do shoulder arthroscopy. Okay. So my topic today is hip arthroscopy made easy. I hope when I finish, you all agree with me, yeah? So, so the, the commonest person you're going to see with is a young man who's an athlete and he comes to you with a groin pain or not to me, but to anybody else. Okay. So that's the most common indication of young adult hip pain is groin pain. Right. And so groin means hip and they go to their orthopedic surgeon. The orthopedic surgeon tells them you're too young, wait for you to have a hip replacement. Okay. And that's the general feeling from the patient. He doesn't like what he's been told. So he wants to have something more. Okay. So, for instance, uh, you, you were already told by Sufyan that most of it is back at work. Most of the referrals I get are from my uh, uh, spine colleague who does a lot of back pain work when he's done his back pain work and he's excluded everything. He says, can you have a look at it, Mr. Shah? I don't think so. This is back pain. So half the time in my practice, it's a leap of faith. You have to make sure that this is uh, hip related rather than back pain. And, and that's what Sufyan told you is, you don't stick a camera in unless you're 100% sure what you want to do. Some of the signs are very vague. You don't know what you're looking for, yet you still have a, a very uh, uh, young man who has got right pain and he has no idea what's happening to him. Some signs are very obvious, like the external rotation more than the other side, or you have an MRI scan, uh, uh, which shows you a loose body and there's clicking and you've got all that kind of stuff. Like, okay? So you have to have a plan before you go and start these things. You need to know what you're looking for, which compartment you have to go to, and, and what's your plan. So as Sufyan told you, there's a central and peripheral compartment and there's a lateral compartment. This is a very nice um, uh, flow chart he showed you. I think if Sufyan shares that somewhere for all of you to have it, that's even better, like I said. Okay. So, so like I said, you have to have a central and peripheral compartment to start with. So I use my fracture table and I have the image intensifier put into the middle of the patient. I've now changed when I first started, that's what I was doing. I now go to the other side of the hip and come across because I don't need to have a lateral picture, just a central picture. So I don't have to break the patient's legs apart. Okay. So it's a simple, straightforward traction system and an X-ray image control. Okay. And these are my uh, um, <coughs> portals. So that's anterior superior leg spine. You draw a straight line downwards and a straight line backwards, 90 degrees. Okay. And th this is the uh, trochanter. This is the anterior portal just above and anterior to it, this is the posterior portal. And my working portal is at 45 degrees between the angle of the anterior superior expanding forward and backwards. That's your working portal. These are your vision portal, but you keep straight swapping and changing them. So the first thing I do is call a traction test. I put the patient on a table, and if I can't get this picture where I can't uh, subluxate the hip, I, I don't do them anymore because then that means they're too arthritic and the capsule is too tight for anything. So this is my first thing. When I consent them, I tell them, when you are lax and you're asleep, which is what Tardis does, he paralyzes them completely so that everything is lax. So I tell them if I can't subluxate you, I will not proceed. This is what I tell them before I start. So the key is once you put them on traction, the traction is also very specific. You have to duct and, and, and do tractions, which means that the hip comes out of the socket. Unfortunately, I don't have any uh, pictures to show you that, but hopefully next time I'll show, take some pictures here. Yeah. Once I subluxate them, then I put a needle uh, under vision in, uh, at the superior corner of my trochanter. And when you look at it, you're in the joint. Okay, so this is what's in the joint and, uh, and the x-ray will confirm it for you. Uh, and again, it is going slightly up at an angle to get it. <laughs> very easy because once you put the needle in, you know you're in the joint because you can't go anywhere. There's no stops you from doing it. Okay, the next thing I do is I put air into it. This is called an air arthrogram. So allow me to know where I am in the joint or not. Is it outside the joint or inside the joint because the capsule will put the air into the joint. Once I know I am in the joint, 
I will put a natinal wire through the needle. Okay, so the natinal wire I put through the needle, uh, I will then confirm it on X-ray, and I have uh, this this made for me. This is basically a switching stick with a hole in it attached to a T-bar. So then what I do is on the wire, I will put the switching stick with the T-bar <coughs> into the joint that I was. Okay, so once I do that, I will then put the arthroscope cannula on top of my switching stick and therefore I am in the joint now. Okay, so it's as simple as that. I don't have any, have any special technicals, guided uh, instruments because like I said, if I asked for a hip arthroscopy set, they would say, are you mad you're a shoulder surgeon? Why do you want to do hip arthroscopy? So this is what I do. I would put a needle into it, put air into it to confirm I'm in the right space, put a national wire into it, and then on top of the natural wire, put a switching stick on it, and on top of the switching stick, put the sheet of the camera. So this is a sequential dilatation. There are a lot of instruments out of the market which will allow you to go from very small to very big to dilated. I am, I'm sorry, it's just that disturbances. ये <laughs> Okay, I think I've sorted it. I've muted everybody here. <laughs> um, I, I will open the camera. Uh, mute. You, you can actually unmute yourself if you want to, but uh, when you ask me a question, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. So I think I've got to mute everybody. Good. So, so this is what I do. I, I will uh, put a, a neat natural needle dilated with a switching stick, then put a sheet on top of it, and I have got my camera there. And this is the first vision I get. So I get in there. Okay. So this is this is the humeral head. This is the rim of the estibulum. There's a triangle area, which is where I need to put my needle in, and that's the 45 degrees angle I told you between the, the uh, anterior superior leg spine and the labrum. Okay, and this is the vision, the picture you're going to get. And as soon as you get this, all the bubbles disappear and the picture becomes very good. So some of the companies have made a targeting device. Once you put your camera in there, it attaches itself to it and it allows you to do that. But you've got extra control and you can see what you're doing. And so it's not that difficult. Okay, so, so this is my end, end picture from my uh, starting my process before I start anything. Uh, this is my camera in the anterior portal or superior portal. This is the 45 degrees. This is called half moon cannula. This is the only thing that I've actually bought for my arthroscopy, which is like a cannula, but the top is missing. So it allows you to switch portals. That, that's the key for it. That's the only thing I bought for my arthroscopy up, apart from whatever else I had on the show, shelf. So I think I've got a small video that I can show you what I do. Okay, so I put a, a needle into it and, and then I put a natural wire, wire into it, take the needle out. Okay, then I use a dilator which is my switching stick. So I'm getting very clever now. I can take pictures and put pictures into pictures and that's getting better. Anyway, so, so this is where the, the switching stick has gone in there and the sheet will go on top of it to allow me to put uh, my camera into it, okay? So there you go. So once I've done that, then I will go and see that uh, triangular pass where the head and the labrum meets. And that's my 45 degrees angle to allow me to put a needle into where I need to come. There, there you go, it is coming in and you will see it's not difficult. And then once I get that, I do exactly the same thing. I put a natural wire, wire into it. I dilate it and, and put instrumentation through that time. That's how I do both my uh, uh, portals. 
99% of the time, these are all I need. I just keep switching from top to bottom and, and make it work. Like, okay. So I, I don't need to have any more portals, but you can go as, uh, as many portals as you want. I keep it simple because I don't do impingement work now. I, 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 it doesn't work for me. So what I do with these is you can diagnose labral tear. You can diagnose synovial hypertrophy. This is a ligamentum teres tear. Okay, so it's a real pathology. It happens and people can see it. Okay, uh, loose body is the easiest thing to do. You can take the loose body out and the patient is amazingly far better and symptomatically much better. Okay, uh, so once I do the central compartment, there are very fancy things to do, but I, I, I keep my camera where I am and I let the traction go. So when I let the traction go, the head comes back into the socket, which means you're now in the lateral compartment, so, sorry, in the peripheral compartment. So this is the uh, rim of the uh, astibulum, and you can see the head and neck of it, and you can see a lot uh, more uh, by just allowing the traction to go. So I don't do anything um, funny with these guys because a lot of uh, um, books will tell you you have to take all your bits out, and then you put your camera back in a different portal to see your, your lateral compartment, sorry, peripheral. I don't do these things. I just do simple traction release, and this, this comes when this happens, okay? And this is what has finished. Uh, this is a post, post arthroscopy patient who had a... A, a, a basically a loose body which I took out so I've, I've got a couple of more portals and I made but that, that's all you need to do when you're doing uh, 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 arthroscopy of the hip okay so this is another um, area of the hip which is the lateral compartment now in my hands the lateral compartment and the tensor facial lotus the gluteal medial repairs do a lot better and I've got far better results with these than, than I have with, with, with the pincer and cam impingements and all that kind of stuff I can repair the labral tears but this this arthritic pincer cam doesn't work in my hand. So this is um, this is the trochanter, and I've got a portal superior to it and equidistant inferior to it. And these are both my visualizing and working portals. I what I do is I will. You know, I think I don't have those like okay. So what I do is I take a 50 cc syringe, uh, and before I take that, I take a, a, you know the black spinal needle, and I will go in the middle of this trochanter and push it down. And when I push it down, it touches the, 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 the trochanter, and I know I'm touching bone. This is exactly the same thing what you do when you're injecting the trochanteric bursa. Then I put my uh, uh, two trochars and cannulas on both sides, and I touch them. And when I touch them, I feel them, I know I'm in the same compartment. And then I would put my camera in there and start filling this uh, before uh, I put a, a visualize it. And once I've filled it, I would look and localize my needle. Once I know where my needle is, I know I'm in the right place. Okay. So, so this is the setup now. This is my needle. Can you see this needle? This is telling me where I should be. These are my two portals that I made. This is with a switching stick and this is the camera. Once I can touch either, I know where I'm, I'm in the right place. I can confirm with x-ray that I am in the right place. I don't need to because you can normally see it. Okay, so this is what I do with my tensor facial lata uh, snapping or, or bursitis. That's your gluteus medius, which is not that difficult. The tensor facial lata is in, invisible. I will show you some video, maybe you can see it here. Yeah? And, and I do a cut like this, and then I do a cut like this, not going to into a two percent becomes a diamond. The, tr the trochanter then fits itself in this diamond, and the, all the bursa pain is gone. I have I have a series of over 100 patients, and about 95, 96 percent of them doing well just by doing this to them. I don't do much uh, uh, more than that, just maybe shave some of the bone, but that's what I do for my lateral compartment. Okay, and there's a quick video there. So this is what you can see is the fat and this is the tensor facial lata just to come in a vision okay so i'm just taking the fat out just to localize the tensor facial lata on the lateral compartment and you can see the white bit is in the tensor facial lata the red bit is the gluteus medius if you have a tear you can always put it back so you, you you're just about getting to see the tensor facial lata and and hopefully uh, i will show you how to cut it yeah So a vertical line and a, and a cross line, yes, yeah? so a vertical line. And then I will uh, cut that bit and that bit, so it becomes a diamond. So cross line becomes diamond. And you can just about see the trochanter coming into view. So this is my cross uh, uh, cut now going anterior and posteriorly halfway because you know the nerves out there, you don't want to kill the nerve here. Yeah. And just about uh, the trochanter is coming into vision. If I feel the trochanter is very rough, I will take my chromonizer and I will flatten it. 
So that's what I'm doing now. I'm flattening the, the, the and so I, this again, everything I have from my shoulder practice, I've not used anything that, um, that I have to buy in and upset my managers. Unfortunately, we, we are now slaves to managers in this country here. So you can see we're flattening the tuberosity now, the, sorry, tuberosity, the trochanter, nearly. Okay, so, so this is just a picture to show you. That's what the tuberosity looked like before and after I flattened it, this is what it looks like. So I've done a double whammy, I've done a, a, a diamond release for it and I've also flattened the tuberosity for it. And that's the a slide I promised to uh, cause him. These are the things that you can do with a hip arthroscopy. So uh, um, I have a red line here because normally uh, um, uh, Ashwag used to follow me after I used to do this talk. And he used to talk about AVN uh, in hip arthroscopy. Again, that's a very dubious uh, subject in the sense that uh, in my hands, I don't have the result that everybody is claiming, so I don't do it like them. But my indication would be for a diagnostic purpose, for labral tears, for loose bodies and foreign bodies, for synovial hypertrophy, for patients who have bursitis, uh, trochanteric bursitis, and people who have gluteal medial tear. Yes, there's a lot of things you can do, but I have done some pyriformis releases. Uh, I'm now, patient says she's happy purely because she didn't want to upset me. <laughs> I don't know whether this work or not, but that's it. That's my, my take on hip arthroscopy. I've kept it as simple as possible, and I now want you guys to ask me questions if it's possible. <coughs> happy to take questions. I've stunned everybody. Nobody wants to say anything. This is what happens also when I do this in the orthocon, like this and say, I do a very small presentation and nobody asks me questions like that. <laughs> have you ever seen a, a hip PBNS? I have not seen it uh, purely because uh, I am a shoulder surgeon and nobody sends or refers patients to me. What I get from my patients are what people see in my department, mostly back pain work that they haven't got a clue and they send it to me. I have a Mr. Iqbal who's not present today. He's our sports injury surgeon also. And he sees some sport injuries and he sends me uh, some work with labral tears and, and, and loose bodies and stuff like that. Um, but no, I have not seen a PBNS. It would be a lot easier to take it out. It is in the capsule and once you get in there, you would. It would. I think you raised your curiosity by mentioning Mr. Ashfaq doing something for the AVN of the hip because this is one pathology that I, I, I think most of people will agree in our part of the world. Uh, we see a lot of lot of this because of of secondary steroid use and of most of our uh, the uh, the uh, herbal hakimi medicines they include a lot of steroids and more many uh, guys are uh, with hip pathology i think 40 to 50 percent of them are uh, uh, i mean victim of avn of, of the hip so uh, I'm not sure that what his technique is. Do you have any idea that what is actually? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Sadiq, Mr. Sadiq does something very nice. I will show you what Mr. Sadiq does. Yeah. So I, I don't do, I don't do, uh, um, I don't need, I don't think so. You need to have a camera in the joint when you're doing a, 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 a avian work. I don't know why. Once you see your needle coming out to the joint, you've already messed it up anyway. Like this. So I'm not sure why you want to have a, a camera in the joint while you're doing it, you know, but um, he, I, I don't know what's happening to my person. I think he doesn't want to move. I had some nice pictures from Mr. Sadiq's uh, presentation. It is, I think I had a chat with you about it. It's, it's from Wright Medical and it's, uh, you put a big, huge uh, uh, um, hole into the under extra control and then you had a flip cutter in it. It cuts the undersurface of the, <coughs> um, uh, undersurface of the, um, the, the head and then you have uh, uh, some bone uh, um, putty that you put in which is which is called ignite which actually uh, makes it solid like cement but it's, it's bone based yeah so I can't I can't see it I, I saw it yesterday while I was teaching to the, the boys but <coughs> it's gone. So if you just give me a minute I'll show it to you uh, so meanwhile you are just uh, checking your this presentation I have a one query uh, like in a shoulder, the labrum is to stabilize, stabilize uh, the shoulder joint. If it's tear, you have to repair it. So what about in the hip joint, the, liberate, uh, the labral tear itself, by removing it just to uh, uh, the positive of the pain or any tear in the labrum, will going to have any impact on the shoulder joint or uh, there will be no issue with that? 
So, so you can't take the labrum out. Uh, it is a structure that gives you stability. However, the, 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 we, I think we had a talk about this where the shoulder is not the hip joint, the hip joint is hollow and therefore you get a lot more stability. So a labrum actually is catching and causing you pain by traction. So you, you can take it off if you want to, but um, in, a, in a young person with a labrum being totally normal, I would not recommend doing that. But, but my understanding is it causes more mechanical pain than anything else, like, so it's not a pain in stability. So this is what, what, what is available. You, you under image control, have a look inside the humeral head, which has got AVN, right? And you put this instrument in there and then it opens out. You can see that it opens out. Can you see that, yeah? And it makes a space, right? You have to dead middle center on this and nothing, but the, yeah. So this is what it does. It makes that kind of space. You have this and that, okay? This is done mechanically. And then you put this bone putty into it, which is like a bone graft but it is artificially prepared and it has got BMP in it. It is, it is expensive, but Mr. Sadiq has got some practice with these, uh, with, with these patients, he's got five of them. And they've all got to do well. So, okay, so I, would not, I would personally not do an arthroscopy to, to see from inside what I'm doing with the AVN because if I, if I, if I break this, my arthroscope is not going to show me inside here, it's going to show me here, like, isn't it? So if I've already, Penetrated it, the, 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 the job is gone. You can put an arthroscope in there for what reason? I'm not sure because that's what was shown that he puts an arthroscope in there after he makes a hole by making sure he does not penetrate on this side. And then he fills them with bone grub. But this is a very nice kit. It comes for AVN. Uh, you don't have to have this. You can have your own uh, DHS ream as in you can make this and then fill this up on the image control with, with where you want to go, where the, the problem is, and then fill it with bone grub. Like so. Okay. So we were not able to see that uh, your presentation, sir. Did you see the x-ray or picture? No. 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 Okay. Okay. So it says I'm sharing it with you, but I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. I think your, your, your system is overloaded. <laughs> I've got so much teaching stuff on it. Like you, you have no idea. Isn't it? Let, let me start again. Yeah. Okay. This is just let me say. You see it now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now yeah, you can see that. What it is, it is the system that has got a pin in it, and the pin has got a, 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 a reamer on it, and the reamer makes a big hole here. So the reamer looks something like this. Um, so it goes in there and it opens out. It's like, you know, the, the one when you're doing those ACLs and you go from inside and they make a uh, opening from inside. So it makes a hole just under the surface where you think AVN is and you thought it, was, it takes all the dead tissue out and then you fill that with bone graft. That's, that's what we are doing here and Mr. City has got exceptional results of them so I can't argue with that. Isn't it? I, I, don't do a, 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 I don't do arthroscopic view to see. I can do it, but I mean, I'm not sure. Why do you want to look to making holes? If you've made a hole, you've already done the deed, isn't it? Like, yeah. Agreed, agreed. Agreed, sir. Fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Lights up, your turn. You want to share your uh, presentation with us? There will be a green folder at the bottom of your scheme which will say share. Oh, very good. So you're better than Javed Iqbal. Javed Iqbal did not, it was not able to share any of his presentation with us here. Just in front of me. Right, so shall I start? Yes, yes, by all means, sir. Everybody's got to do a lot of things I've been told. I keep on the screen that I talk too much, and everybody thinks that Sunday is the time for recreation, isn't it? Then finish now, so that's up. Your voice is not coming properly. No, it's breaking up. Uh, you need to first of all is, is make your slideshow from the stars and see them if you can speak better. Here, um, 
think your your um, internet is playing up with you. Yeah. Did you want to log off and come back again? Maybe that will work, yeah? Speed is not enough to, uh, for this to have online. So, Zahid, uh, sorry, Sufyan and Kazim, you need to come and help me on those difficult matters. Somebody was asking about TB spiny yesterday. I have no clue. You've never seen one. I've never done anything like, you know. So, you need to help me on this forum to teach people with TB spine. Sheikh Saab said he was going to do it. But Sheikh Saab is always so busy. Oh, okay. Sorry? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can, yeah. All right. So, we'll, um, so I'll be talking about uh, ankle arthroscopy in just a, ba a basic lecture. So did you want to click slides here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm recording this. So I'll give a copy of all of you in the future so you can look at it. And anyway, it's amazing the Zoom thing. I think uh, uh, um, 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 Alam Zeb introduced me to Zoom. I, uh, he, he was uh, very good with this. He started work with his teaching and we got it. We, we still can't hear you, Zaisal. Can you hear me? I was not speaking. I'm just listening to you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry, I will stop talking. All right. So, uh, arthroscopy is a, is, a, is a very useful tool. It involves minimal soft tissue dissection, um, decreased post-operative pain, and uh, the main the main uh, advantage of uh, doing any arthroscopic procedure is that there is an early return to function. And today, we'll be discussing the implications of ankle arthroscopy the setup, the different portals and techniques, and just some examples of some of my cases. Uh, indications, obviously, are then articular these soft tissue impingements. Uh, some type of fractures you can actually uh, you can actually fix with the help of arthroscopic guidance. Uh, the ones we commonly see in our practice um, is the sorry. Uh, the, the one we do most commonly are the osteochondral fractures, and sometimes we do an orthodesis of the ankle uh, using an orthoscope. Uh, and these are the not, an article uh, by Glassbrook, uh, actually sort of gives an evidence-based uh, recommendation for different sort of uh, uh, interventions. And the one he, the one he always goes against is basically an ankle, uh, uh, an ankle osteoarthritis. But as far as the positioning is concerned, I mainly do it as a part and I just bring the patient. I just um, I just bring the patient at the edge of the table and just let the, and let the leg uh, hang. I use a tonic and use a, uh, some sort of external distraction device. Um, and the device basically we don't use anything fancy. Obviously in Pakistan, so we just use uh, a simple roll bandage and just put either a weight on it. Or, um, or one of the assistants can just pull on it and it, it gives you sort of enough distraction. Even if uh, just holding, uh, just uh, hanging, the heck, uh, hanging the leg on, on the side of the table also gives you enough distraction. Uh, while making the portals, obviously we mark all our important landmarks, which is basically the dorsalis, uh, the pedis, the cephalus vein, and the nerves. The portals, just in my screen. The portal we mainly used are the interior portals. Interior got three main portals, the entromedial portal, the entrolateral portal, the entrocentral. The two commonly used portals, which I use, are the entromedial and entrolateral portal. And you also have the posteromedial, uh, posterior portals, which are the postrolateral, postromedial, and transacles. Uh, the, the one I commonly use are the postrolateral and postromedial portals. Now, on the diagram, we can actually see the marks. And the basic landmark, which I use, is the tibialis interior. So intermedial portal will be medial to tubalis uh, anterior, um, and uh, the cephalus nerve and vein are mainly medial to that, and it is one of the portals which is established first, and it is sort of our primary vein portal. And as on the diagram, we can see that we we are, we are very near uh, the cephalus vein and nerve. And this is sort of a picture you get. So from the needle, you can actually see the way you approach the ankle joint and sort of its relationship to the different part of the uh, part of the talus. The interlateral portal is a portal journey which is the second one which is established and you will establish it with the help of uh, that needle technique. You put in a needle and then make a small neck. Uh, it can also be used as a prime, uh, primary view portal but majority of the time we use it as a it's a primary working portal, and it is usually just lateral to the tracheus muscle, 
and the superficial pleural nerve. Uh, but before putting this entrolateral portal, it's always better to sort of know where the different branches of the superficial pleural nerves are. Uh, this is just a, um, just a diagram showing you sort of your entry into the uh, using the entrolateral portal. Um, and this is, a, this is a technique which has been described by Stevens. And, and actually, what you do is if you flex the fourth uh, toe, you can actually see the branches of the superficial pleural nerve. And it's very important uh, to save them at the time of making your entrolateral portal. The postrolateral, we've got posterior, we've got three posterior portals the postrolateral, the postromedial, and the trans -echalis. Postrolateral is just adjacent to the lateral edge of the Achilles tendon, uh, maybe about one centimeter lateral to it. Postromedial is just medial to the Achilles tendon because you don't want to go more medial because of the chances of damage, uh, damaging to the, post, uh, to the uh, tubal artery and nerve. Uh, some people also use the trans Achilles portal, which uh, generally speaking will be a, an easy portal, but you tend to run the chances of uh, damaging or scarring Achilles tendon. So you can actually see all these portals there. And these are the different instruments we use. Uh, although some people will use a four millimeter scope as well, but I tend to use a 2.7 millimeter 30 degree scope. Um, and, and you need to have sort of, you need to have, you can actually work with the same punches, but slightly, slightly smaller punches, maybe about 1.8 or two millimeter punches and, and curates sort of which, uh, uh, which are angled uh, because you'll be, you will be, you'll be working in a joint which is not as flat as a shoulder or a knee joint. So you, you, you need to, uh, you need to enter different recesses. So for this, uh, you, you may need different ports as well, but then again, you may need uh, different angle instruments as well. So first of all, when we start, we inject uh, we inject the joint and we actually distend the uh, distend the joint with some normal saline and a small neck. Then to end with an RT, we just uh, we just open open into the joint, put the rotoscope in, uh, and then we see inside the joint. And uh, and again, with the help of a needle, you make your entrolateral portal. Use that as a as a working portal. Uh, once we go into the joint, there's a, according to the ferrical, there's a 21 point examination you can do uh, about, uh, about uh, 14 from the anterior side and 7 from the posterior side. And when we go in, basically, we start, I usually we start from the medial side, uh, go towards the medial gutter, toward the medial talus, the central part of the talus, and you just go around the talus from the medial to the lateral side. You can also go from the lateral to the medial side, but it's easier to go from the medial uh, to, the, to the lateral side. Um, and, then the, and again, if, you, if you're going from the posterior side, especially the posterior lateral portal, uh, then you can actually see all the posterior part, uh, the posterior part of the tail, especially the, the gutters and especially the posterior pedal uh, fibular articulations as well. But it's just in current case of ost uh, osteochondral lesion. Uh, this is an otoscope. You can actually see a piece sort of uh, floating around, and this actually has been cleaned. Uh, and then the area has been sort of microfractured. Uh, another patient uh, suffering from anterior impingement, and you can actually see a small piece of uh, uh, protrusion on the anterior part of the tibia. And this uh, has been sort of shaved off. And this is sort of the post operative picture. And our next, you can actually see that small sort of uh, calcification has been shown off. Another thing we use sometimes is for ankle orthoresis as well. And it's a very, uh, I must say, ankle orthoscopy, the joint is not that much destroyed, then, especially in my hand, it's, it's a good way of doing an ankle orthoresis as well. Because one of the problem of the in ankle orthoresis is to get rid of all the articular cartilage because the success of an ankle orthodesis will uh, depend upon how, how well you can debride or you can clean all the articular cartilage. So um, it, is, it, it, it is a very useful tool of uh, getting rid of all the articular cartilage because once when the articular cartilage is denuded, all you need to do is to just fix in position with the help of some, um, uh, some cannulated screws. Obviously, with, uh, along with other uh, things, it also has its complications as well. Now, majority of the complication rate can run from anywhere from two to six percent, and the most important complications are all in, mostly in your vascular because you are working very near, especially sort of the superficial nerves, 
Immunopraxia uh, is, is a common complication, especially in the interlateral portion, you need superior peroneal nerve is uh, quite, uh, is quite near, while the intermedial uh, portal, the, the sphenous nerve and, uh, and vein are quite near. If you're using entrocentral portal, which basically sometimes you have to go through the, uh, to, uh, to, uh, through the extensor, uh, extensor tumulus, there may be a chance of damaging the trosseter speedus nerve. So in a nutshell, uh, arthroscopy is a very useful procedure. It has got quite a lot of advantages in open surgery in some cases, especially, uh, if, if, especially in osteochondral fractures, ankle arthrodesis, uh, and especially getting rid of impingement. Uh, it has some potential neurovascular complications as well, but fortunately they are not that hard. Uh, and, and it's really important to say, identify your portals exactly, uh, because in that area there are quite a lot of nerves, especially superficial nerves, and if you damage some of them, then the patient do develop some neuromas. Thank you. Any questions, anything? So, so very good, yeah, I mean, uh... It is a difficult uh, uh, joint to get to. When I'm doing wrist arthroscopies, I do exactly the same as I don't cut anything besides the skin. The skin. And I use my small knee artery uh, uh, to open it. Although saying that, I don't get into the capsule because if I do, then all the fluid comes out of it. So I go up to the capsule, but not into the capsule to make sure that all the vital structures are away. It's an amazing tool. And I do agree with what Zaitsa was saying is that uh, arthrodesis is one of the main indication that people are now using this more and more. Yes, it's a diagnostic tool. It actually tells you about anterior movement. You can take uh, a lot of loose bodies and flaps and everything like that. But, but yes, uh, it is a tool that we all need to, to have and use. And it's not difficult. I, I don't use uh, the 2.5 or 2.7 uh, scopes, but I have the 2.7. I still use a normal scope. I, I don't do them anymore because um, I've got too much older work now. When I started them, I was doing them. And, 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 and we, we in Europe have got the stirrup. It is exactly like what you've used, but it, it basically is, is like that goes in uh, superiorly anteriorly and holds the heel and the forefoot and this protraction on it. But yeah, very good. Uh, anybody else wants to ask a question from Yeah, Sufyan? Um, Professor Zayed, an excellent presentation on uh, how to uh, deal uh, difficult pathologies regarding the ankle um, uh, issue. Uh, one thing I would like to ask that uh, uh, most commonly we come across uh, some steroid-induced uh, AVN of the patchy, uh, I mean, uh, isolated AVN of the, uh, the, the upper part of the talus. You've actually shown that you have done microfracture in uh, the upper part of the, of, uh, the talus bone. Uh, ankle articular cartilage, I mean, it's a very, very narrow area of, of, of space as compared to the knee joint. You've got a huge area on the knee joint, knee joint, but ankle is got approximately about 25% of what the knee articular surface has to follow. So my question is that, what are the, uh, does microfracture actually is able to hold this sort of uh, um, pathology or is there any, uh, have you ever come across secondary avascular necrosis progressing forward? After having microfractures of your of your of your anchor of your upper part of the talus, what are your your results regarding uh, the the microfracture of, of of the talus bone? Well, actually, uh, the, the, the whole problem is that majority of actually you either you need to do a re MRI or you need to do a re arthroscopy of the sometimes in order to evaluate the success of your treatment. But the problem is the majority of patients they 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 either don't come or even if they come they do especially if their symptoms uh, have improved then they usually don't uh, don't uh, sort of uh, don't even consent for a, for an MI because according to them if the symptoms have improved uh, then why bother with another arthroscopy or an MRI so on clinical grounds I can actually say that the symptoms do improve I will not say that symptoms improve completely. But the, but the few I've done, I've noticed about a sort of 60 to 70 percent improvement in their, in their symptoms. But what I cannot, what, what I cannot tell you is whether morphologically have the stem, have, has the lesion improved or not. So I'm sorry. Uh, so but another, can I help many you? Of the, uh, yeah, there is an American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery on improvement of symptoms. And by definition, if you can improve 25% of the patient's symptoms, that's success. Okay, so all you have to do is take the mechanical bit out of the flap. And if you take the mechanical bit out of the flap, you know, the symptoms will improve. And if you do microfracture, you're doing a, a, a blood-borne biologics or for the patient to, to do his own biologics. 
Now, it's a shame that Amit Qureshi is not here, but I would tell you that you can do PRP injections there. And, you know, you're not losing anything. Unfortunately, it's too costly. But in my practice, it is 80 pounds. That's all it's worth. And the, you know, the, the ACP that I get from Arthrex, so it's not that kind of money and the NHS pays for it. But uh, by definition, you need to improve 25% and you're a success. So if you take the flap out, the mechanics will go, mechanical problem will go in and you will definitely have success. The patient will like it. He would not be 100%, but he would love it. So that's, that's what it is. But yeah, go on. You were going to ask the question, so if you can, yeah? Uh, sir, I have a question to Dr. Zaid. Uh, sir, very nice presentation, very much elaborated about the basis of arthroscopy. So are you using the same sleeve for the, as we use for the knee, or you have the specific 2.5 mm sleeve uh, for this? Uh, with the 2.5 millimeter. 2.5. I think it's, uh, it's unfortunately, it's, it's a chin. I think it's, it's 2.7 millimeter sort of scope. So you are using the China one. That's I think it's cheap also, so easy can be used. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. So 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 that's uh, uh, the light uh, and the source. Everything can be uh, uh, be placed uh, on the, the same. light and the source is the same. Exactly, yeah, exactly the same. But the problem is that the picture you get is uh, uh, unfortunately the the camera system we have got is not that advanced. The picture you get is slightly smaller as compared to one respect from a four millimeter. Okay. Uh, but the rest of the camera and everything will fit on the top of it. So, like in the knee, is like we can have excess of posterior media, posterior lateral. Like, of course, we have the distal proximal. In ankle, how much excess? Uh, like the whole of the dome and the can we see go to the posterior or it's basically the. You uh, no, I don't. You can't go to the posterior, but you uh, actually, if you uh, plant or flex the foot. You can see quite a bit of, of the posterior part of the dome as well. Uh, not the whole posterior part, but I will say maybe about 25% of the posterior part. And if you want to see the whole, you probably have to come from posterior. But you have to actually dorsi, uh, sorry, plantar flex the foot uh, in order to sort of get to the posterior part of the dome. So what are your indications, sir, in which we, you go for ankle arthroscopy? Are you like fracture are your indication or you don't uh, do arthroscopy? The majority of the patients we see here, are, they are either osteoporinal fractures or ankle okay. orthodesis. And sometimes uh, some, sometime the patient is complaining of synovitis or unexplained knee uh, ankle pain. So we go and do, do an arthroscopy. Okay. Thank so, you very much. So Amran Bhatsav has joined and is keeping very quiet, you know. So you do a lot of ankle arthroscopies. Do you want to, to make a comment? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a nice presentation by, by Zahir. I must say, when I started a couple of years ago, I was doing all those things, what uh, Sufyan and Kazim is asking questions. Number one, I don't use any more traction. If you put it at the edge of the table and actually use your belly, dorsiflex the ankle. And that actually helps you release the anterior capsule. You don't need a special 2.7 or anything. What I found that I don't use any special, the same I use for knee or a shoulder, and you go more sort of a horizontal. Yeah, you do need to spread. The indication has, has lots, and then, then you can do. What I've started doing is the post-medial portal you can go in, and you can actually, I've started recently doing two, three cases of sub scope as well. It's much easier than actually you think. So if you go from posterior medial, you can very easily go and you have to just spend some time cleaning it. And the ankle joint is just superior and inferior. You see a subtalar joint. Apart from them, you can use your tummy. As, as Zahid said, you can, you can plant reflex them. I hardly find any difficulty actually doing from there. In terms of indications, yes, there are osteochondral patients coming to us. There are footballer ankles. There are osteophytes. There are lots of things. People have started doing repairs of the ATFL, which I have never done. I don't have the stuff. Uh, arthrodesis I've done. And uh, I think it's, it's much easier learning curve, especially for, 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 for both young surgeons who are asking questions. The knee is the knee and does not have much structures. Once you nick and spread, you're pretty much there. It's just a matter of keeping it simple. So if you keep it simple, more horizontal, actually, I found keeping it dorsiflex ankle helps the capsule and makes your arthroscopy much more easier. So if you put the weight or put any traction, I used to do a funny traction. I used to have a crepe bandage. We can't afford like 
straw can in UK. So we used to have a crepe bandage around the foot and I used to grab them around my tummy and back and I used to lean with the weight, with the body weight. But I, I found the more and more I'm doing is just getting very, very easier. And uh, you can do lots of things from, from uh, posteriorly like uh, uh, shell release around and uh, I mean, I mean, and, and they're, they're pretty, I don't even stitch them, you know. I, I never had a fistula or anything. And uh, 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 they're, they're pretty okay. Yeah, you can put them in cast if you have both. I think it's very, very good technique. And uh, as I have presented very nicely, I would just say this, just be careful with the nerve and just nick and spread. Don't actually think it's um, it's actually... Uh, as a knee or a, or an ankle scope or a shoulder scope. It's a little bit different, but it's a much easier learning curve, which I found in my life. Yeah, I mean, I don't do them anymore, but when I used to do them, this is what I used to use. This is called the Gould's stirrup. So um, I could see most of everything. You know, this would allow me to, to see quite a lot. I never used a 2.7 scope. I always did the same normal scope that I did with my uh, uh, um, shoulders. These are views from my patients. You can see a medial compartment. You can see the dome of the patient. And then you can also do, I mean, the commonest things I was doing them for, was for the footballer's ankle as anterior imprinting, as you can see in this picture, right? And, and, and you, you need to use your belly to push it down to have a look. Uh, that's what, 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 what I used to do. Uh, like I said, I've given them up. Uh, I also do the subtalar arthroscopy, or I did subtalar arthroscopy. These are pictures from my patients. You can actually see quite a lot with those portals, okay? So it, it, is, it is not difficult. It's just you need to be aware of your limitations. And, and when you first start, you think you can see everything. That's not true. There's pick and choose your indications. I think orthodesis is a good indication. I think uh, um, taking the, lab, the, the, the osteochondral fragment is a good indication. Taking anterior impediment is a good indication. Going into the subtalar joint to actually take some loose body of the fragments out is another good indication. But keep your uh, indication limited, and if you do, you will have brilliant results here. So, I have done, and I've done for someone else's, but two cases of PBNS ankle, and they did really well because you can go from front and from behind, and the way you can approach uh, a PBNS, I mean, it, it is brilliant. But I must say, Mr. Shah and myself have a big advantage of a big belly as well. Yes. And that helps situation yeah so, no, really... not belly, but you're pointing to me like isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway so, so well, i think I'm we've sure. had a good session we, we need to call it a day but before we finish can we decide what we want to do next time now zahid saab is doing a a, a, a a biologics meeting so i think to give zahid saab time i think we need two months in advance we will do an autobiologic session here and we can link with zahid saab's meeting if uh, zahid saab agrees to that so that Next month should not be orthobiologics, but in two months' time, we'll do orthobiologics. We'll give sites how to prepare what he wants to do. So we'll link it to that. And most of us can then talk from, from this uh, thing. But I was thinking, should we do elbow and wrist? That's the only arthroscopy is left. And then we go back to sport injuries, something like ACLs or PCLs or you know, um, multiple joint injuries. Or whatever you want to guys do, we will do it. But the next one will be the end of this month. That sounds good, okay. If we, we do orthobiologics in two months, and then you can link us to your meeting then. Yeah, that should be all right, yeah. Good. So, so guys, what do you want to do next time? Postolateral corner injuries of the knee, please. Okay. What else? So, anybody else? Uh, Sufyan, uh, uh, Kazim? Follow the seniors, uh, which so we will, we, we, uh, well, we will have the same uh, as uh, Mr. Salimi has. Uh, well, we are uh, still two things more have to be, uh, if we can have uh, some, we can throw a light on it. One is elbow and the wrist, and uh, that we're going to uh, finish our all the arthroscopy based arthroscopy concept for the different joints. And then we can have uh, sub, sub topics for every uh, joint that club shoulder come with, like uh, pen card. Then we have a rotator cuff, uh, bicep. So specific. Uh, uh, Part of any of the yeah. uh, arthroscopy that will further going to enhance our knowledge and uh, our way to treat that those yeah. problems. I think we should we should we should complete the circle. We can combine uh, two lectures for uh, elbow and one for wrist, or two for 
wrist and one for elbow in the next in the next meeting so that will give us a 360 degree horizon first and then we'll go into details of a uh, specific joint yeah i mean i'm i'm happy to continue this way because i've learned quite a lot from 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 you guys too like isn't it i mean i, I don't know everything like i said i've always i pretend i know everything but i don't know everything like you know so so i think uh, we can do wrist and elbow i mean uh, will good said he wants to talk on 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 wrist arthroscopy so maybe we'll get him and rope him in to do this next time so we can do one uh, wrist uh, arthroscopy session indication and one elbow arthroscopy keep it short if you can get uh, um, um, either you sufian or kazim or uh, uh, um, um, gracious up you know uh, um, to to uh, amir to to um, see if he wants to do posterior lateral corner because uh, that's a sub subject that a lot of people have got confusions on and also multi ligament injury so, so hopefully we do, we know in two months time we're doing orthobiologics so mm -hmm. next time we will do uh, elbow arthroscopy indication and wrist arthroscopy indication and if we have time or amir agrees to or what if you agree uh, uh, um, then we can do a posterior lateral corner or we can do um, um, we can do ACL something like that, isn't it? Yeah, so, come on, sir. Do you want to do elbow arthroscopy next time? I have only seen, never done. We do <laughs> restart. I've done. I've, I've done quite. Uh, I've done about five or six elbow arthroscopy, so I can speak on it. So, so we're not sharing, but I'll show you mine. I've got over 150 elbow arthroscopy practice, okay. like we said. So, but I've done a lot of work on it, and and and, and the other thing that I was told by. Um, uh, um, one of my colleagues was that if you could put fluid into it, you can watch it. So I do pre patellar bursitis and olecranon bursitis also with arthroscopes now because the scar is much better and the patients do well. Okay, so it's agreed. We, we will do uh, a Zaitsab. You can do the elbow arthroscopy if you want. Yeah, I want you guys yes, to watch yeah, okay, it. Yeah. Zaitsab can do elbow arthroscopy. Um, uh, Kamran Sab, do you want to do posterior lateral corner? I don't mind. Yeah, so you can do the posterior lateral corner. And and Sufyan or Kazim, one of you can volunteer of, of, of indications of, of doing elbow and wrist arthroscopy. I can see if I can get Mr. Good to do uh, wrist arthroscopy. Should we call it a day? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lord. So before I finish, I need to uh, thank you all the people who are silent in the background. I can see Bakir Saab, you know, you've not said anything at all. But thank you very much for joining us. Salimi Saab is always there. Uh, Abdi Saab is, is there. Uh, so thank you very much for joining and thank you for being part of this forum here. So Sufyan, when, when you started, there was seven people attending. When Zaid Saab started, there were 13. And when I started, there was eight. So everybody Zaid Saab has implanted his, I, his, his trainees to come and join us. Can I let, can I say, can I say hello to, Salaam Alaikum to Zaid Askar. He did a wonderful oh, ACL side surgery. So thank you very much for all the help. I think he's, he's wonderful. And Mr. Shah is our Shah, you know, he's a lighthouse. Yeah, but I mean, education should go on. You can't be satisfied with what you've got. You have to do more. You know, you have to it's teach and you have to learn. It's a global right. We should all follow, you know. And the young guys, Sufyan and Kazim and some of those guys, I don't know. So thank you all. Thank it's you, sir. Wonderful. Yeah, and the good thing was it, the timing was great. I finished my 18 holes golf, and that's the only time. Yeah, we're not worried about your golf. You know, this is education, sir. And I say I was the second, so I'm very happy. But keep it like after lunchtime. So, so because 18 holes. Just to what you're saying, Kamran. Yesterday, I used this forum to teach the juniors who are doing FCPS exams. Yeah, there was 27 people, and they were actively participating and asking questions and answering viable practices. So uh, it's amazing how this, this forum, I think this is, again, uh, uh, not my uh, original. Somebody actually showed me this forum, but it works. Okay. I, I will make, uh, save the video and I'll post it to you guys. You can have a look at it then. All right. Thank you very much. Well you. done, Mr. Shah, for all the books as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Salaam alaikum. Well.